Good morning. Good morning. Um, great honor to be here. Thanks so much, Margaret, for asking, and Christy, and everyone who put this conference together. It's been really great to be here. Met all sorts of interesting people and uh, had some fun last night, but I got in early because I knew we'd be up here this morning. Um, I've got 30 minutes, and I'm one of those guys who's still clearing his throat after 20. So Christy's going to keep an eye on me. She's going to give me some heads up, but you be ready for the hook because I'm, I'm going to get wound up here. Um, first of all, let's talk about, you can point anywhere, there we go. So um, we, whenever we give this talk, we always start with this image because everything we do, everything we do comes from the land. It all starts with the land. We wouldn't be here, we're, we're supported by the land upon which we live, uh, and it never, it never hurts to be reminded of that. Okay, um, so there is a farm at Worm Farm Institute, and so let me, let me, uh, get the name out of the way here first. Um, so we moved to this farm about 25 years ago from Chicago, from inner city Chicago to rural Wisconsin. And within a couple of years, uh, you know, we were seduced by the growing things and life in the land. And uh, within a couple of years of doing this, we uh, started a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. I think most people know what that is now. Um, and we were thinking of a name for it. I mean, there were lots of farms out there. There are Whispering Pines and Twin Oaks, and, and that wasn't us at all. Um, so we were uh, early in our education, our farm education, we, we uh, were alerted to this quote by Charles Darwin, who everyone mostly knows because of that crazy evolution thing he did. Uh, but he, uh, after that, he studied earthworms. And there's a really beautiful little treatise he wrote on, on the formation of vegetable molds, the action of earthworms. And so here's the quote. Every fertile grain of soil has passed at least once through the gut of a worm. All right? Which to me, that, that's a really beautiful sentiment there. It really puts us in our place. But when I'm at the farmer's market and I share that with people, they often scamper off to whispering pines and twin oaks. So... Um, so this is the farm here. It is a, uh, a former dairy farm in rural Wisconsin. Uh, we are, oh, wrong way, that way, that way. There we go. Uh, for those of you who don't get to the Midwest, uh, that, that's our county right there. We're about an hour uh, north of Madison, Wisconsin, the state capital. And we are exactly, exactly halfway between the Twin Cities and Chicago. So these, these connections are, always, are very important for us. So um, I said we, we run a CSA. I, I, we're in like our 23rd year of doing that now. Uh, right the, the morning, uh, Wednesday morning, before I left, I was actually planting. So um, I, I'm literally grounded, and I, I really find that those uh, connections help me in all the other work that we do. So here's a little piece of the garden. This is from our landscape there. Uh, not close enough to see the weeds or the insect damage. Um, so one of, the, of our, our foundational program is an artist residency. And this started um, because when we bought this farm, we didn't realize, we were, we were so ignorant, uh, we didn't realize that uh, a farm was constant toil, right? Um, and so we, we moved to the farm, and our friends from Chicago, who are mostly artists, you know, they wanted to come and visit. And the deal was if you hung around for more than 24 hours, you'd get put to work. Well, for most of them, that was, that was like, oh, this is great. I like doing that. So that was the seed of what became a, an artist residency program. So now that's gone on for 20 years. Uh, usually young emerging artists come from all over the country or all over the world uh, to uh, make art, uh, live in rural Wisconsin, and they give us 15 hours of help each week in the garden, which we market through CSA and farmer's market and things like that. Uh, and then in exchange for that, they get room and board and the time and space to create their own work in this beautiful uh, uh, rural surroundings. Uh, in 2000, so this was 95 we moved in. In 2000, we, we bought a building in uh, downtown Reesburg. So in Chicago, Donna had purchased an 1890 storefront and restored it, and, and that was great. And, and this uh, building you're looking at here uh, was a similar vintage, but had been... Um, covered with aluminum siding and boarded up windows, and Donna had a, a, a straight job at the time, and she drove by this building every day on her way to work, and she said that she um, uh, mentally undressed it when she, when she drove by. So we bought it, we restored it, it's now in the, uh, the uh, National Register of Historic Places, and we used that first floor for a gallery for a while. Well, are there any gallery owners out here? I mean, I saw the, uh, 
Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I, gallery, galleries in, in rural Wisconsin are a bad idea. Um, they, they, we, we had lots of fun, we put on some really great shows, and mostly for ourselves. And, 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 uh, but every time we did it, one or, one or two more people would, would sort of climb on board a little bit and discover us. This was actually sort of later in our, in our, uh, our series of uh, seasonal shows. And the, 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 uh, that building was the office for the old woolen mill. So this is a show that was actually acknowledging that history. And this woman is actually a, a local organic farmer, but she's also a spinner. Um, so the, the, the gallery thing was not having the type of impact we thought that needed in the community. So we started reaching out and doing uh, community cultural events. This was Puppet Fest. Uh, from like 2004 to 2008, we offered free puppet making workshops in a city park, uh, making giant parade puppets, and then we closed down Main Street to, to uh, have the uh, have a parade. Um, yeah, this uh, built on a uh, old Toyota or a Nissan actually, some, someone's little Nissan, the uh, the chicken tractor. Anyone here know what a chicken tractor is? Yeah, if you you know, so when when we, we did that for a while, and, and people were really intrigued by that word, and this is one way of interpreting that. So anyway, that that worked for a little while, but um, it still didn't really uh, fulfill our what we thought was our mission: this uh, integrating culture and agriculture. So here's this this term that we came up with to sort of embody that, and uh, and. Uh, we coined that in 98, and I think, I think everyone knows what a, what a watershed is, right? A, a geographic region that's linked by its surface waters and why it's important to preserve those things. Well, in our work in sustainable agriculture, we learned about a concept called food shed, which is where a, a geographic region seeks to become nutritionally self-sufficient as much as possible. We steal like our coffee and bananas and stuff. So a culture shed is, is a step beyond that, and it's an uh, attempt to create a uh, culturally self-sufficient uh, region. And, and this is not to be an isolationist or too regionalist, but, to, but not to be dependent on uh, what I call like the baby bird model of cultural dissemination, where we sit with our mouths open and, you know, in Disney or somebody, distant content providers are feeding, you know, stuff down our gullets. So we want to, we want to create and we want to be part of that conversation, but we want that work to be informed by the place in which we live, the history and the people of the, of the region. So, our culture shed, uh, Wisconsin, is full of self-taught artists, visionaries, they call them. Uh, this is Dr. Evermore, uh, who is one of the greats. He's all still alive, but barely. And, and so these, these are folks that, are, that are also inspire us. And we also ha live in a community where uh, Amish, a couple different Amish communities are prevalent. So th these are, are part of the range. And then the, the land. Uh, we live in a place in Wisconsin, the southwestern corner of the state is called the Driftless Region because the, the, uh, the glaciers that scoured the rest of the Midwest avoided this area. So it's a very ancient landscape, hilly. We are talking to somebody, well, we call them mountains, but they're you know, rising several hundred feet uh, off the plain. Um, but it's really beautiful, ancient landscape, some really unique biomes in there. But, and because of this hill and valley, it's, it's resisted the... Uh, the agribusiness that, uh, that has taken over much of the rest of the, uh, the Midwest or the country. So we still have lots of small farms, uh, dairy is predominant, um, but also a growing number of organic farmers. So um, in <coughs> excuse me, uh, 2010, we were fortunate to lure a uh, Smithsonian traveling exhibit. They have a Museums on Main Street program that brings pre-made exhibits to your town and you're selected based on the strength of your supporting programming. Well, the one that we hosted was called Key Ingredients America by Food, which was ideal for us. And we were thinking about what would our, what would our uh, supporting programming be? And when everyone thinks of Wisconsin, they think about beer and cheese and you know, sausage and things like that. And what those things all have in common is that they're fermented. And so we created a, a, a something called Fermentation Fest. So this is another idea, agriculture shock, looking differently at rural communities. So Fermentation Fest, a live culture convergence, uh, it began as a partner to this, um, to this Smithsonian exhibit, and this was the first time that we really got our, our, our business community, Chamber of Commerce, and all those people on board. Uh, not a lot of people wanted to jump on board and play with Worm Farm, but when you brought the Smithsonian in, then all of a sudden people paid attention, they wanted to play. All right, so we're, we're in this planning process and we're having a great time and things are moving along and then the, you know, we have the realization that, okay, the Smithsonian is leaving and will never come back. 
So, you know, we have this great thing, Fermentation Fest, so we decided to keep it going. So it's a, Fermentation Fest is a, uh, said, a, a, a live culture convergence, a celebration of food and farming with an emphasis on fermentation in all its forms. Everything from yogurt to poetry and sauerkraut to dance. So, and it's also a very potent metaphor. And I, I, I guess I'll drop this right now. I was shared this with somebody uh, earlier. So, um, transformation, abundance and transformation. You, it's controlled rot, controlled decomposition, right? That's what fermentation is about. But it also extends shelf life. <clears throat> it uh, creates dense nutrients, strong flavors, and in some cases, altered states of consciousness. And we embrace all of those in, in our uh, fermentation world. So, um, Here's a great quote, Sander Katz. Any, any fermenters out there? Sander is the current god of fermentation. That flavorful space between fresh and rotten where all the world's most prized delicacies exist. So we, we really like emphasizing that part of it. We like you know, to get, make people a little bit uncomfortable, you know, like that worm poop thing that I was talking about earlier. So the fest itself is classes, dinners, tasting workshops about the nuts and bolts of fermentation uh, taught in, in mostly in downtown Reedsburg in vacant storefronts or underutilized storefronts. This is a kitchen design uh, showroom that had working kitchens. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a class on sauerkraut taught by uh, local farm wives. I mean, we live, live in a region where these things are still practiced regularly, making sauerkraut, making sausages, making beer, making wine. And, uh, and then we also reach outside the community and bring in guys like Sandra Katz. To, to, so we have the, the, the local talent, but also we bring in folks from the outside. The centerpiece of the, of the Fermentation Fest is the Farm Art Detour, which is a 50-mile uh, a self-guided drive through the beautiful working lands of Sauk County, punctuated with temporary site-specific sculpture and local food performances, and that's what the most of this is gonna be about here. So I'm um, gonna get on with some images here. Here's the, the most recent loop. There's been two different versions of this so far. Uh, Reedsburg at the top of the screen there, that's 15. Okay, <clears throat> just getting warmed up here. Okay, here we go, get ready. Um, so this is this loop that goes through four small towns. There's about 40 to 50 stops. Each one of those stops, I don't know if you can read those numbers, represents a, an art installation, uh, some local food, uh, a point of interest. And, and so on this route, we get about 20,000 people, 22,000 people the last time we did this in 2016. There's the categories, and I'm just going to rip through this here. Again, the landscape is really, really the, the, the star of this and the, uh, and the work of farmers. That's really the highlight. So artworks are commissioned art. Uh, commissioned by, uh, there we do our national RFP, select six to eight or ten artists each year to create temporary art that's placed in there for ten days. This is, it goes from a, a Friday to the following Sunday and every day in between. People are driving this route. Um, and this is a perfect example of a way to deal with the landscape. Do not, it, it, the landscape is huge and so don't try to compete against it, just highlight it. Uh, working with existing uh, art, uh, agricultural structures. No, no one uses corn cribs anymore for what they're intended to use, but turning them into lanterns. Uh, creating the, this is made with um, uh, nylon ribbon and uh, electric fence post wires, and it vibrates and makes wonderful noise in the wind. Uh, this is uh, giant paper mache boots created by a Minnesota artist, and this is a, a Mennonite family uh, making the approach. That they, these boots are 10 foot tall, uh, this was early in the week, so weather is always an issue, and this was the first day of the, of the event during the week where there was, you know, eight inches of rain and 70 mile an hour winds, so by the end of the week those boots looked like the dog had chewed them. Um, this one has Colorado roots. This is from an artist collective called M12. They're based in, uh, based in Denver. Uh, this is Prairie Module number three. Uh, so farmers are critical in this. We're not only are we doing this on farm lands, but sometimes we need their assistance, and sometimes we ask them to borrow a tractor. So what do you do with that tractor? Well, we're going to embed it in a wall of firewood. <laughs> okay, and so we did. It was up there for 10 days. Uh, we took the wood, we, we disassembled it, we took the wood and delivered it to a, a family in the, in the community that heated with wood and maybe couldn't afford all of it, and the tractor returned unscathed to the farmer. So there's a range of works here. That's a great response, thank you. Um, some of the stuff is a little bit more challenging and some of it just really crowd-pleasing. Uh, there, there's another image that I didn't have room to put in here of the size scale. These things stand about 13 foot tall 
but it's also addressing, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we're having an uh, a increasing problem with feral pigs, and I think it's called too much pig. So a real crowd pleaser. Here is, uh, so those boots were from the very first year. This was from the last year. This was called Reboot. And those things actually moved. Uh, they're, on a, it's, they're built like uh, rail cars. And they, it takes two people to move, move each of them. And I was in one of them. It was like being in football practice again on a blocking sled. Um, this is a piece that's called Drift. And I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but it, it's a, a, an artist collective from Chicago. They did their research. This, uh, this is floating in a, the headwaters of an a, of a, 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 a impoundment lake. And uh, these are glacial shots. Let me see if I can do this real quick. So the, the glacier that missed us is still in existence. It's up above the Arctic Circle. The, these women found someone up there to, to gather some of this glacial water and ship it back down to the Midwest. In the meantime, they engaged with some of our local residents, artist residents, to gather some herbs and, and, and fruits from, the, from the, 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 that season. And they infused this glacial water with this seasonal crops through a sous vide and then froze them into little ice cubes. And when you went out on that, uh, that drift raft, you would get a communion. So it would be this wonderful, this combination of this ancient water and these, and these seasonal flavors. So. Um, this was a work of the Baraboo Range Preservation Association. So, yeah, I'm just going to have to rip through some of these. This is, uh, was called uh, Invasive Species from an artist from Brooklyn. These are uh, knee leaves that are knitted from plastic bags. And what she did is she put the pattern online and, and, and uh, asked people in the community to help her create them. And she had a, uh, she offered a prize for the person who made the most. So the person who made the most got a prize, but everyone who contributed, she came and she made them breakfast. She brought these cookies from Brooklyn and, and just really engaged the community. So that, that's a really big part of this, if I'm not getting that through. That this is, this is really embedded in the community that uh, our, our neighbors and the farmers are participants, not just observers. Oh my gosh, I got to talk about this one. So this is, uh, that is a, uh, a, a diagram of the, of the Milky Way, a spiral galaxy, but it's made out of manure. So, um, and there's a, the part, this is, this is one, it's got dung beetles are involved and carbon sequestration and all sorts of crazy things. But the really important part is we had to work with a nutrient management specialist. That's a professional shit spreader, right? <laughs> And so we had to uh, figure out how to draw with a manure spreader. And we, you know, we learned all about side slingers and, and all this. And, uh, and then the farmer whose land hosted this, he, he was a little hesitant to have some outside manure. He had to know where the, the source of the, you know, whose cows were these. And once we told him who it was, then it was okay. And the woman who did this, she was a, she's one of these kind of anti you know, agribusiness radicals who doesn't know anything about farming, you know, and she works side by side with the nutrient management specialist who deals every single day with large scale conventional farmers. And they had to talk and they came to an understanding. And I think I have an image of that's uh, Suzanne, but there's also her and the, and the nutrient management specialist are drawing with rakes with the manure, drawing it out. So that's a, that's, that's a really wonderful thing about this, the, these, these interactions that take place. This is Musical Fence Interactive. Um, this is called Sylvan Chapel. Um, you'll see that one later. Temporarily attached to trees. Nothing is, uh, nothing is fixed to the trees. It's just strapped on there. Uh, this is a piece called Dumpling House. And it's sort of made to look like a, a steamed dumpling. But inside, two artists from the Twin Cities, uh, Molly uh, and, uh, and, and Emily, were, were making dumplings every single day of the week. It's like, like fermentation, every culture has some sort of dumpling. So they had a different dumpling and they would teach the first person who came in how to make it and the next person that came in would learn from that person and, then, and so on and so on. And uh, so there was this, this, uh, this, but it was all about storytelling. They, they were eliciting all these great memories about how, when their mom or grandmother made, made uh, dumplings. And this is a really remarkable images, image here because men are helping. Uh, that, uh, that almost never happened in the entire 10 days. Uh, this was a piece uh, by a poet, uh, John Chamberlain, and this is one of those things that, uh, is that art or is that like an old farm truck? And it's like, it's, it's both. Um, this is called Monday is Wash Day, a three-quarter mile clothesline. Um, 
ex uh, ex install in a farm field and really great when the wind blows. And, and so uh, when we were installing this, these clothes were collected sometimes temporarily from people in the community. They arranged according to the, the uh, color spectrum there. And we were a little worried about people coming to steal them. Well, that didn't happen, but people came and added things to it. Uh, <laughs> There was a, a, apparently a giant brassiere that was uh, put, placed on there, uh, some soiled underwear uh, that, that the artist just took, she just took and placed them where they should have been in the spectrum. So we weren't happy with that. So this is a really interesting piece. This is called Ghost Barn from an, uh, I'm not gonna tell you what it's from. It, in, in, in one way, it was sort of a failure. It was underbuilt. Um, it's actually supposed to be blowing the other way. It was sort of the, this outline of the Dutch Gambrel barn and it, this, this wafting parachute fabric is supposed to be this ghost version of it. The wind came from the other way. It was underbuilt. It was fall, mostly blew apart. But there was one day where someone got a perfect image of this and as a result it won a uh, uh, visual arts network gives away uh, award for public art and this was, an, this was a winner. So um, Matthew Mazzotta who was just here this is one of his pieces. This piece first appeared in, uh, uh, here in Colorado, and then he dragged it out to us. Um, it was called Harm to Table out here. Uh, out by us, it was called Last Supper. I think the similar thing, the, this, uh, uh, let me see if I can make that work there. There's uh, this, this tank up there contained a drink. It was called, uh, out by us, it's called Switchel, which is like Amish uh, Gatorade. Uh, but it's, but it's created with uh, either uh, apple cider vinegar and uh, maple syrup or honey or something like that. And of course, these are, those three things are going to be severely impacted by climate change. And I don't know that anyone really got that message, but they, but they really enjoyed as a place to gather and play music. Um, I'm just gonna rip through some of these. Here's another one, that the same artist that did that drift piece did another one. Um, these benches are called uh, Leopold benches. Anyone know Aldo Leopold? A few people. Um, yeah, this, I, I'm sorry, I can't even tell you that story. They're, they're turning those benches into carbon. They're making biochar out of the Leopold benches. We built uh, over 200 of them, laid them in, in the, out in the field there, and then during the week they chopped them up into pieces, put them in these kilns, and turned them into charcoal, and then gave them away. Um, someone thought that they were burning Aldo, St. Aldo as we call them around us, were burning Aldo Leopold in effigy and created a Facebook page saying, save the benches. So the, the artist showed up one morning and people were loading benches in the back of their car and say, what are you doing? So we saw the Facebook page, we were supposed to come and save them from being burned. And so it, it, the piece didn't work out quite the way the artist intended, but it was really an interesting social practice experiment. Uh, this is called uh, field chimes, land chimes. These are just two, two pieces of conduit, a skinny one pounded into the ground, and over the top of it is a two-inch piece that's suspended with a cable. They're all cut, to, so they, they, they make a tone. Five minutes, oh my God, get the hook. I'm not going anywhere. Um, okay, so most of the stuff takes place in farm fields, but some of it is in town. This was an artist uh, created something called Fermentaphone, and you can see these jars on the right there have uh, the, these little airlocks, and in that airlock he placed some sort of probe that, as, as these things off gas, that, that uh, the bubbles were turned into a tone, which were then, uh, were, uh, then uh, projected uh, out, out in front of the building there. So when it was sunny, it was really making a lot of noise, and, uh, and, and then otherwise. But my favorite story about this is someone w stumbled in there one day and wondering if this was a cell store, cellular store. Can you get your fermentophone? Uh, here's another one that's a series of short stories, related short stories that were installed in vacant buildings in four of these towns. In 2008, in our community, there was a, a devastating flood and, and uh, these towns were all along this, the river or the creek that uh, uh, were impacted and so, um, she created these connected stories about the flood. Uh, gosh, this is called ruminant. All right, so this was meant to be, these, this work is created to be temporary, 10 days, and then, and then it goes away. But the people who lived around this, they asked the artist if he would leave it there um, throughout the winter. And then in the meantime, they raised $40,000 in order to make this permanent. This, this combine was headed to the demo derby and the glass panels that the artist created, the stained glass were already almost pre-sold. But instead they, they brought it all back together, made it permanent onto the, the, uh, uh, the stained glass behind Lexan. And, and then the, in, in Reedsburg, Wisconsin, the town I live in, not known for art, uh, 
created a city, a new park, and this is now the centerpiece of that park. Uh, it's called Harvest Park. And another art organization came as a result of this. So this is a really pivotal piece. Again, the, the landscape. Uh, this is another piece called, uh, another thing called uh, uh, Passwords. So it's roadside poetry, sort of in the manner of the Burma shave signs. We like art, we like cows, both are best with time to browse. And then uh, last year we did a, a different version and these were passwords. So we chopped all those pieces up and then people could just arrange them how they wanted, sort of like refrigerator magnets. Field notes are rural educational kiosks. Uh, artists made signs with uh, the, the text is created with uh, our extension or other people in the community that know about this stuff. I mean, you know, we're ex-city people, so we know how ignorant people are when they come to the ground. Oh, can I eat that corn? Well, not really. And so this tells about that. Another one talks about dairy. Those are cows. <laughs> uh, wetlands, so other features are in the community. Ethics, about Aldo Leopold and the land ethic. Um, this is working with the, the Ho-Chunk Nation, or the, uh, the, the native tribe in our region, and that word up there is their, uh, the Ho-Chunk word for Reedsburg, which means a place of the cemeteries, because we had different burial practices than the indigenous people did. Again, the landscape, performances, uh, mostly on the weekends, out, out in farm fields, our German oompa bands, uh, the, the, the uh, dancing in silks and oak savannas, uh, the brass quintet and the old farmstead, uh, crane Foundation is one of International Crane Foundation. There's you know, demonstrating the crane dance out there. Uh, bluegrass music, dancers, some people who need to use the sheet music in order to figure out what they're doing. <laughs> and then here's a band, Holy Sheboygan, uh, playing in the Sylvan Chapel. Uh, here's someone she's doing, uh, she's singing arias. The skirt she's wearing is made out of corn husks. She's on a hay rack, the piano mounted in the field, singing arias. Here's the audience right here, the landscapes around. What you can see is on the other side of the road is our cows lined up along the fence and they are answering her as she sings. <laughs> Have I been smiling? Donna, I made her smile. In fact, someone take a picture of me and I'll, I'll smile. Uh, so another piece is local food. So uh, another project is these, uh, this is our earlier worm farm project called Roadside Culture Stands. Artists designed and built mobile vending platforms that we match with uh, different entrepreneurs. They're supposed to look good whether they're open or closed. Uh, they can go in the city, they can work in the country. Uh, they're linked by this, this idea of homegrown uh, on a bicycle. And then they, we gather them together at places called food chain sites. So a couple places along the route where our uh, entrepreneurs and vendors share their wares with, uh, with the visitors. Landscape, farm forms. This is art, art made by farmers. Uh, we got to deal with guys like this. These are, this, these are the suspenders and belt farmers that um, you know, we had to convince to, to do crazy stuff on their property. And there's guys like this who we just have to turn loose. Uh, this is a silage bag. He's painting to look like a monarch caterpillar. He's, I mean, this is a real dairy farmer. He and his wife are milking like probably 150 cows. He should be doing something else right now, but he's, he, he, he found the time to do this. Uh, another farm turned these round bales into, they're the whole field into like a billiard table. Uh, hay sculptures, they did, these guys never did anything like this before. They did them every year. They were invited to go to the local county fair and create them and said, nope, we only do this for the detour. And they always had a border collie in them. Uh, the Goat Jungle Gym, working local Amish farmer. Uh, local businesses creating large-scale sculptures. They, they have the machinery to do stuff like that. Um, do you guys have tractor fat fanatics? Uh, um, we had these guys who they, they just love their old tractors. Any opportunity to show them. And, but of course, they also want to engage with, you know. So there's like 22,000 people. About half of them come from outside the area who, who are interacting with farms and farmers for the first time. And, and this is probably one of those valuable things about this is this, are these, these conversations that take place where, you know, the, 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 the locals are always a little bit, um, they, they, you know, slap their knees about the, the ignorance of the, of the folks that come out there. But there, it's also this really warmth and sharing about the knowledge that they have. And on the, on the, on the other side, then the, 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 uh, the visitors from outside uh, demonstrating their appreciation to the work for the work that the farmers do. And so we, I've been talking to several people about the importance of outside eyes in your community and, that, and why, why that's important. That's one of the things right here. This is called the Red Piano. Uh, that other nonprofit buys an old piano, paints it orange or red puts it in a location and people just come up and play it. <coughs> this was a corn labyrinth, can't even talk about that. 
wealth, the wealth in the landscape, the land. This is something called rogue installations. So the farm forums, artists tell, farmers tell us what they're gonna do, but then things just started popping up along the route where we had no idea. So after a couple of years, we, we called them rogue installations. You know, usually involving hay bales and stuff. Um, this right here, oh my God, this makes me cry. This is in this little town called Ironton where we could never gain any traction at all. No one would talk to us at all. And then at the third year, this thing showed up in, in someone's front yard. And it's so beautiful and sad and funny and pathetic all at the same time. And yeah, okay, keep moving, Jay. So, and then the, the, the local, the existing community attraction. We have a rail museum too, Mid-Continent Railway Museum. Uh, the fiber farm, the local churches, the landscape again, and why, why is it important now? Uh-oh, I just lost my confidence screen. Okay, and here's our regional assets. I've talked about the re re uh, Driftless region. I mentioned all the Leopold. Uh, we got, you know, artisanal cheeses and all that stuff happening. Talked about our place in, in, the, in the, the larger upper Midwestern landscape. There's people who support this work. And there we go, the end. There you go.